Thanks for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, joint work with my, um, my two colleagues at MSR, Patrick Longer and Michael Narig, who are both up the front here. Okay, so we've heard some different opinions on um, when or if quantum computers are going to come and destroy all of the public key crypto that we're um, currently using. And a lot of people, some people think that it's never going to happen, some people think that they already exist, and a lot of us have, uh, are in some camp somewhere in the middle. But the agencies and companies around the world um, are doing their due diligence and have announced that the standards are going to be updated um, in the next decade or so anyway. Um, so in August last year, you might have seen the, the announcement from the NSA that the, um, the Suite B cryptography will be, the, the, the Suite B um, is going to be updated to include post-quantum um, algorithms. And in this, just this month, following a sequence of announcements, NIST have said, and even said last night, that um, they're going to be pushing for a, a, an agenda over the next five years um, with a deadline late next year to look at post-quantum uh, candidates. Now, this is just the um, examples in the States, but in uh, Europe and Asia and all over the world, there's many, uh, many, many companies, groups, and organizations that are um, investing a lot of time, effort, and money into examining post-quantum candidates to see what we're going to do um, to replace all of, these, all of these things that will fall if a quantum computer or when a quantum computer comes. So in our group, we've been seriously looking at this problem as well. Um, and, and in general, when you go and look at any of these documents that talk about post-quantum uh, cryptography, you, you see sort of four common themes or four common arenas that people are considering um, or, or seriously considering to, to look for post-quantum primitives. Lattice-based uh, lattice stuff like Entru and LWE and its ring variants, um, code-based cryptography, hash-based, and multivariate-based. Um, and often after these sort of four strong pillars of, of post-quantum primitives, you see a paragraph or um, a subsection mentioning all of the other ones, and sometimes you see isogeny base mentioned along, alongside um, some other ones. But we sort of, from, from all the study we've done so far, um, we think that, the, that isogeny base is worth uh, being considered as one of the five, um, the five pillars that we should be looking at for uh, post-quantum public key, public key crypto. So, in this, in this talk, we're going to be looking at um, the, this, this fifth one, isogeny-based crypto, by, uh, it was su the super singular iso isogeny Diffie-Hellman that was introduced by Zhao and DeFeo in uh, 2011. I think one of the reasons that it, it might not yet be considered as, um, as stronger of an option as the other four is because of, simply because it hasn't withstood the test of time, it's, it's much newer than these other four. Um, but on the other hand, it really offers a lot more, um, or, or in some situations, it shows a lot of potential compared to these, to these other four primitives. Um, in particular, yes, it's, it's a lot younger, and it's so the, the confidence is, 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 is a bit smaller, but so are the key sizes. Um, the, the best attacks against SIDH uh, are exponential in the, in the size of the, the prime field, um, and therefore we've, we've got a, a primitive to do Diffie-Hellman where the, the, the public keys are a lot smaller than um, the, a lot of these other variants. And so, uh, oh, yes, okay, so the first thing I want to warn you about is not to be deterred by the word super singular because um, for those that have been in the game of, of curve-based crypto for a long time, we'll know that um, super singular curves have had a rough ride in, in cryptography, starting with the original ECC papers that recommended super singular curves as an option um, because they were easy to count the number of, or, or, or to write down the number of points on them. Uh, and then in the 90s, we saw the, the attacks by, by Frey Rock and the MOV attack that showed that we could use a pairing to um, attack the, the finite field version. And then they were brought back when pairings were used for constructive purposes. Um, and then we, we decided that there were ordinary pairing friendly curves that were better than super singular curves. Um, and in recent times, those super singular curves that, that seem to survive that, the, the low characteristic ones, as you saw in the last talk, have been, um, have been attacked. But all of this is kind of irrelevant uh, with respect to this talk, because all of those highs and lows of super singular curves um, have related to the discrete log problem. Um, and the point is that in this work, 
the discrete log problem is, is irrelevant. This has nothing to do with the discrete log problem. In fact, um, the curves that, that we use in SIDH, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a curve that has an easier discrete log problem than the, than the curves we use. So the discrete log problem is easy on these curves. It's got nothing to do with that. Um, so if the word super singular makes you feel cautious, don't uh, try to ignore that, that hunch. Okay, some basic facts about, um, about isogenies. For, for anyone that's done the, uh, that, that knows the basics of elliptic curve cryptography, um, you deal with isogenies all the time. Um, if you're computing a doubling map, uh, the, the multiplication by two map, that's an isogeny. It's just a particular case of an isogeny where the, um, where the uh, domain and the codomain, the, the, the curves E1 and E2 are the same curve. Uh, but an isogeny is, is more general than that, um, than the multiplication by M map, which is an endomorphism. An isogeny is, is, a, um, is a map that takes uh, points on the curve E1 to points on the curve E2. So when you come to double a point, you do some computations in its X and Y coordinates, and magically you land on the, um, on the same curve. An isogeny is kind of even less magic than that, if you like. You still do some computations in the X and Y coordinates, but you land on a different curve. It's all, it's, it's all very natural um, uh, because it's a, it's a group homomorphism, and so um, it's, it's a, there's a very natural one-to-one -one correspondence or connection between um, isogenies and, and their kernels. So if you uh, write down a kernel or specify a kernel, um, by the definition of it being a group homomorphism, if, if the isogeny maps a point P to um, the identity or the, the point of infinity, if you like, then uh, it would map any multiple of that point to the point of infinity. So um, it's, we, we naturally uh, have this correspondence between an isogeny and its kernel, um, and it should be said that up to, iso, up to isomorphism, if you, if you specify a subgroup on an elliptic curve, there exists an isogeny um, and, and an image curve, a unique isogeny and image curve such that that uh, subgroup is the, is the kernel group. And, and we write the, um, we either write that the, the image curve is the uh, uh, sogeny to E1 or to the uh, E1 quotient with the, with the subgroup. Now the degree, um, the degree of an isogeny is the number of elements in its kernel, um, which is the same as its degree as a rational map. So you should think of an isogeny uh, as being, as I said, a, a, a generalized, um, the, the, the general case of an endomorphism, which is where the, the, the two curves are the same. Um, and if you, you're used to dealing with an isomorphism, then an isomorphism is just an isogeny of degree one, where the, um, where the, the kernel is trivial. And, and so high degree isogenies have a non-trivial kernel, um, but these are just, uh, an, an isogeny is just a general, um, uh, a generalization of these, these two things that we're probably used to dealing with if we've done even the basic ECC stuff. Okay, so here's a, here's a, um, a brief history of SIDH and where it, where it comes from. Um, in 2006, after a series of papers, uh, of, of Russian papers by um, Stolbanov and his, and his advisor, um, uh, Rostovsev, they proposed doing um, isogeny-based Diffie-Hellman, uh, but they, they chose ordinary curves to, to instantiate the, the Diffie-Hellman. Um, and in 2010, Charles Zhao and Sukarev uh, gave a quantum sub-exponential algorithm to attack, um, to attack the ordinary case when, the, when the, 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 um, the curves used were ordinary. So in 2011, Zhao and DeFeo fixed this by choosing, um, by instead choosing super singular curves. For those that don't know the difference, that it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of equivalent definitions of ordinary and super singular, but an elliptic curve is either one or the other. Um, so the natural thing to do if, if ordinary curves were were broken or, or there was this sub-exponential attack was to look at the super singular case and that's what um, Zhao and DeFeo did successfully in 2011. Um, so the, 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 yeah, as I said, there's a lot of equivalent definitions. You can see Silvermorn or, or any of the good elliptic curve books to see what the difference between super singular and, um, and ordinary is. But for our purposes, um, the, 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 the important thing is that the, uh, the endomorphism ring um, of, of super singular curves is non-commutative. Um, in, in the ordinary case, it's commutative, and that's what allowed them to do this um, quantum sub-exponential attack. But uh, this non-commutativity of the endomorphism ring is what, uh, what makes the attack uh, not work 
in the, in the super singular case. So that's what gives us this, um, this confidence that at least that attack isn't applicable in the super singular case. Okay, so um, this is kind of the cheat sheet for, um, for you that if, if, if you don't take anything else away from the talk, if, if nothing else makes sense, then um, hopefully you just take this slide away. Um, on the, in the two left columns, we've got the, uh, the Diffie-Hellman that we're used to doing, um, finite field Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, where our elements are uh, uh, elements modulo a prime, our exponents are, are typically integers, and um, we've got these analogs of, of you know, the fundamental operation in, in Diffie-Hellman based, uh, based crypto, exponentiation in the group. Um, and of course, the hard problem is the, is the, um, the discrete log problem, the, the inverting that operation. So in the SIDH case, um, our, our elements are curves in an isogeny class. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and our secrets are, are the isogenies. Okay, and so the, the fundamental operation that we're going to do in SIDH is to, um, to get our secret isogeny and to map it uh, and to apply it to a, uh, um, to apply it to a curve E and output the, the uh, isogeny evaluated at that curve. Okay, so the, the problem that we're basing our security on is given the curve and its image curve to go and find what that secret isogeny was. Now, Although this, uh, I said that it's only been around since 2011, uh, we've got some confidence because this problem, this general isogeny problem, has been studied by, uh, by mathematicians and, and cryptographers for some time. Um, it's appeared in, in several other contexts as well, so we've got confidence that it is hard um, to solve. Now, what do these, um, as far as uh, what, what sort of a, a, a setting we've got, what it looks like, it's... Um, you shouldn't really think of the, uh, the, the, the elements as being a group. Um, it's not a group as such. Uh, but, but what we've got is a, a, a very well-connected graph, um, a well-connected regular graph, where the nodes are elliptic curves, or rather isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. So every node in this graph is an elliptic curve. And the edges in the graph are the isogenies between them. Um, and in the super singular case, we've got a, a really big graph. It's well-connected. It's, uh, it's regular. Um, and it's got this, this nice property that, that Zhao and Defeo talk about, this Ramanujan property, where um, we're told that if you, uh, from, from any point in the graph, so long as you, work, you walk far enough, um, you, you, you can land at any other point in the graph. Um, and, and in the SIDH, we certainly walk much further than that to make sure that from any point in this regular graph, we can um, land at any other point. Okay. So here's, uh, here's the very simplified version of, of SIDH. Here's SIDH in a nutshell. Um, sweeping a lot of details on the, under the rug in this slide, but there's this public base curve, E0, that everybody has. Um, and what Alice is going to do is she's going to um, choose her secret isogeny. And the way she does that is just by choosing a secret subgroup on E0. Remember, subgroups and isogenies are in, are in correspondence with one another. So Alice chooses this secret subgroup and computes the isogeny at E0, computes phi of A, and publishes her public key as E of A. Uh, a technicality is that Alice is going to compute two, two isogenies and Bob's going to compute three isogenies. As long as these two things are co-prime, it just, it's just a nice way to make sure that they don't interact with each other and, um, and everything is well behaved. <laughs> But Bob's going to do the same thing. He's going to uh, evaluate his isogeny at, at the base curve and publish his public key, EB. Then they're going to compute some different isogeny to land at the shared secret, e, e of AB. Now, the obstruction that Zhao and DeFeo had to overcome, this kind of non-trivial obstruction, is that um, because the anamorphism ring isn't commutative and uh, they, that, that phi of A could not just be applied to, to this image curve as is. Um, and so a, a technicality that I won't get into too much details about is um, how they overcame this. But essentially what they have to do is, and I ask you not to worry about uh, keeping the details here, but these are just for, for future reference. Um, what they have to do is, is evaluate, also evaluate their isogenies at um, some generator points. And this means that they can, um, that they can eventually arrive at the same kernel. So without Without this extra information, it's hard to know what, what these phi b dash and phi a dash should be. 
but so long as um, Alice and Bob not only compute their, the isogenous curve, but also um, evaluate the isogeny at some public generators, at each other's public generators, then that's enough for them to um, arrive at this, this shared secret. So that's the obstruction that was overcame in this 2011 paper. Um, and I should say that because these, the nodes in the graph are, are isomorphism classes, the shared secret is the J invariant, which is, um, which is the same regardless of, of, of which curve they arrive at as long as it's in the same isomorphism class. Okay, so that's how, that's how SIDH works uh, in a nutshell. There's some, some details that are swept under the rug, um, like the fact that in uh, the, 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 these uh, secrets are chosen as subgroups of the torsion, and the torsion's two-dimensional, two which is why there's um, which is why there's two points here uh, chosen. We, the way we actually choose this secret subgroup is to choose a secret scalar and to compute this um, this this two-dimensional PA plus SA, SA times QA, which chooses a unique subgroup in the two-dimensional torsion. We couldn't just fix one generator here because it would always be the same subgroup that we're in. Okay. So, what about the security? Um, again, sweeping many details under the rug, but um, the security, the, the setting is these elliptic curves are over FP squared, where P is a large prime. All super singular elliptic curves are, um, are defined over FP squared. And our hard problem here um, is not only given the curve and its image, but given those two points on the curve and their image under the isogeny. So it looks like the isogeny problem with a little bit of extra information that, that is um, believed not to add any advantage, at least in the abstract sense of the problem. Um, so the, the, the hard problem is, uh, yeah, given the, given the curve and its image, try to find the secret isogeny, what, or what was the secret subgroup that was used equivalently to, to compute that isogeny. The only difference between this and the general, um, the general isogeny problem is that uh, because of the nature of the system, the uh, isogeny that we're dealing with here has a fixed public um, and smooth degree. Uh, but yeah, we believe that this doesn't, um, that the problem is still very, very hard under this, under this situation. Now the best known attacks, um, the best known classical attacks are big O of P to the one fourth in the, in the prime characteristic of the field. And, and uh, that's the best classical attack and the best quantum attack is, is big O of P to the one on six. Now the nice sort of um, confidence, confidence building um, fact about this is that these are sort of, given this, this problem of trying to, connect, um, trying to connect two nodes in a graph where the, the degree of the connection is known, this is a classical sort of problem in, in computer science um, called the claw problem. And as, uh, as Jao and DeFeo say, these complexities are, are, are optimal for, for such a, a problem. So the best known attacks are currently um, generic, which kind of reminds us of, of ECC in a way. Um, the, the, the best known attack is Pollard Row, which is generic. It doesn't use any of the underlying structure, um, which, is, which is confidence building for now. The, the, um, it should be said, and I should have said earlier, that one of the things that we really like about the SIDH being having such small keys is um, the keys are so small that even if these attacks, even if different attacks come around where these exponents are even better, the problem is still very interesting. So long as it's not a, a, a catastrophic, you know, sub-exponential or polynomial time attack, um, then SIDH is very interesting compared to the other, the other four, um, the other four uh, post-quantum primitives. Okay, so let's start to talk about how we how we do these computations. We need to compute um, we need to compute isogenies of some degree. Now it should be said that. Computing an isogeny of degree of, of prime, degree, prime degree L has uh, complexity at least big O of L. Um, so it's a, uh, it, for exponentially large primes, it's these algorithms are exponential. Uh, but we need uh, an exponential number of, um, of isogenies and kernel subgroups for this, um, for this problem to be hard. So the upshot is that um, the isogenies must have exponential degree, but to be able to compute them, we need to do these things in, in logarithmic time, and so we can't do that unless they're, unless they're smooth. So we're going to only be using isogenies of degree L to the E for L being two or three. And so this is how, it, this is briefly how it works. Um, suppose we've got a point R naught of order two to, the, two to the 372, this is actually from our implementation, 
uh, the parameters that we used, then uh, of course we can't specify all two to the 372 points in the kernel of that, um, in, in the subgroup of R0 to compute that isogeny in one go. We have to factor this thing into two isogenies. So what we're going to do is start with our R0 and multiply it by two to the 371 to almost kill it. Um, and then this point has order two, which means that we can, we can proceed from E0 to E1 using a two isogeny. And then we evaluate that two isogeny at R0 to get R1, and then we almost kill R1 on the new curve, and we keep doing this all the way down until we've computed 371 two isogenies, um, the product of which is the, is the large, um, the large secret isogeny. Um, I should say that there's a much faster way than this sort of, uh, this is like the naive way in, in the, um, in the uh, Jiao and DeFeo and, and Plut follow-up paper, or the extended version, they, they show a much faster way, but for the purposes of this talk, it's just to show that there's two types of arithmetic that's going on in SIDH. Um, namely, there's a lot of uh, arithmetic happening on a fixed curve, so when we're, when we're varying points on a fixed curve, and then we have to compute an isogeny to get to a new curve and do arithmetic on that new curve. So it's not only the traditional ECC arithmetic that we're used to, but also this isogeny arithmetic. Okay, so the motivation for our, for our work was um, we looked at the, the original implementation, the proof of concept implementation, that which, was, which was really encouraging in terms of performance, but we wanted to know whether we could securely deploy SIDH in practice. Um, and I suppose one of, the, one of the fundamental things we wanted to do was to see if we could mimic the, um, the level of constant time, side channel resistant, um, software that, we, that we've come to be able to implement in the, in the traditional uh, number theoretic settings. So we wanted to s sort of strive for that same level of constant time behavior and see whether uh, this brought up any new issues um, as, far as, as far as SIDH goes. So as far as performance goes, we sort of had three, um, three improvements over the, over the uh, original implementation, but I'll only briefly talk about one of them today, um, namely no number one, if you want to learn about the other two, then come up and talk to one of us um, or read the paper. So I'll talk about this projective isogenies and, and the fact that we're now working in P1 everywhere in one slide. So in ECDH, as I said, we, we usually move around with different points on one fixed curve. In SIDH, we do that as well as move around with, uh, we, we move around with different points on a fixed curve and then we change curves and move around on a new curve. So um, the, 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 this contribution was sort of mimicking what was already done in the ECDH case um, uh, by Montgomery and others, which was to show that instead of working with um, both the X and Y coordinates on a curve, um, or rather when you cast that into projective space to avoid inversions, you work with uh, X, Y, Z in P2, instead of working with all three of those, you can drop one of the coordinates. You can drop the Y coordinate and just work in, in P1. So this is what Montgomery showed you could do very efficiently when the curve is fixed. In our case, we wanted to do that and to do the same thing when we, when we proceed from curve to curve around the isogeny graph. So um, it was particularly nice, especially in the case of Montgomery curves, where instead of updating these A and B coefficients from curve to curve, um, we decided to work with them projectively to avoid inversions, and uh, we, we realized that instead of working with all three projective coordinates um, on, a, on, on a curve like this, we can again ignore the B coefficient um, when, when working in the Montgomery form, and the reason is that the B coefficient, all it does is tell you whether you're on the curve or it's quadratic twist, and in the context of SIDH, um, both of these things have the same J invariant. So it's, it's kind of nice that we can ignore whether we're on the curve or it's quadratic twist. We end up with the same shared secret even if we ignore these, these B computations. So mimicking the, the arithmetic of Montgomery on the, on the curves, we're able to do similar arithmetic um, uh, in, the isogeny, in the isogeny graph. Okay, just quickly, this is, these are the parameters we chose. Um, we, we were striving for a, 128 bits of, of uh, security against the best known quantum attack. So our prime is roughly 768 bits in size. Um, this is our starting curve that's public for everybody to know. Um, here's the number of points on the curve. It's got an easy ECDLP. Um, we, our public parameters, these are the generators that Alice and Bob have to know um, of each other to, to evaluate their isogenies at. 
Their secret subgroup or secret isogeny is chosen by 48 byte um, private keys. Their public keys are, are three, um, three X coordinates, which represent the, the, the X coordinates of the, of the evaluated isogeny and also determine the evaluated curve. Um, the details are in the paper. And at the end of the day, they come to compute this, this common J invariant, one element of FP squared, which is 188 bytes. Okay, let me quickly talk about performance. Um, so in this, in, this is our, our performance compared to the, the, the prior implementation. Um, uh, it, it's somewhere between two, 2.5 and three times faster than that work, but I should say that there's a, um, there's a lot of different things going on, and namely, the, the most important one is that this work is, is in constant time, so um, the prior stuff did a lot of inversions, but was, was calling non-constant time inversion routines for that. Um, in our case, we avoided a lot of inversions um, because we wanted, them, we wanted to compute them using Fermat's theorem in constant time. Um, so a, 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 decent, a decent saving over the, the prior work, um, and just very quickly, I thought that um, one other thing that we, that we thought was really good to look at was to see how this, um, how this would perform with a, with a, hybrid, a hybrid scheme that was um, incorporated classical ECC with um, post-quantum SIDH. So the, the motivation here is especially because SIDH is so young, um, we might want to pair this with, uh, uh, with the elliptic curve discrete log problem to at least give us some sort of strong classical guarantee that this thing's not going to fall um, to anything but a quantum computer. Uh, and in, in the, the hybrid case is, is very, um, very attractive, especially in the, in, in the terms of SIDH, because you can do a lot of code sharing. You've got all this um, arithmetic lying around to do the Montgomery ladder um, on, your, on your super singular curves anyway, but of course for the ECDLP, we don't want, um, we don't want such a curve. We want it to, be, to have a hard ECDLP, so it's as easy as just changing one constant and using all the same software, and for very little, um, for very little overhead, yeah, uh, you get um, a lot more classical security based on a much more long-standing problem, which is, which is quite attractive. All right, I thought I'd finish on a slide that compares um, SIDH to um, some of the popular lattice primitives around. Um, so this is the performance of, um, these are the performance numbers taken from the paper Frodo, um, which, which looked at implementing uh, a plain LWE like Diffie-Hellman analog, um, and so you can see the trade-off here. In the, in the last column, you've got the size of the public keys, and it shows that SIDH is, is significantly smaller than these other lattice, these other lattice schemes, um, but you show that we have a, 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 a quite a significant performance gap here. But what I should say is that these numbers are, these numbers are for the plain C implementation of this work, um, and this is really favorable to the lattice primitives. For example, our assembly implementation um, is, is, you know, 14 or 15 times faster than our uh, plain C implementation, and the speed up on the other cases uh, isn't, isn't anywhere near as extreme. So um, when you come to look at this, look at a hardcore implementation of these schemes, it's sort of much closer than this gap suggests. But nevertheless, this is, this is what it looks like. Um, it's a trade-off for small keys for a little, a little slower performance um, for, for ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. I should give some, um, just finish by advertising that there's a paper coming into AsiaCrypt all right, I've got to stop. Paper coming to AsiaCrypt that's talking about uh, public key validation, um, and uh, that just got accepted to AsiaCrypt by Galbraith, uh, Petit, Shani, and T. Um, and so our library only supports ephemeral SIDH. There's some issues with public key validation there. Thanks very much.